Today, in collaboration with United Way of Central Ohio and with support from Fifth Third Bank and The Ohio State University, we're pleased to present the 2015 Champion of Children Report. Mm. Both Fifth Third and Ohio State are well represented today by many of their associates. Won't you please help me thank them and welcome Terry Austin, Vice President and Wealth Management Advisor, Fifth Third Bank, to the podium to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Kermit. I'm happy to be here today and to say that Fifth Third Bank is proud to support the mission of the Columbus Metropolitan Club week after week to engage the community in the conversations and the newsmakers that are important to our citizens, our leaders, and to the overall quality of life in our region and the state of Ohio. Today, the 2015 Champion of Children Report is focused on current affairs and public policy issues regarding boys of color. This is a significant conversation and report for our community. On behalf of Fifth Third Bank, I'd like to thank United Way and its many partners for your efforts and the work that you do to benefit and advocate for the children of our community. Fifth Third Bank is a proud sponsor of your 2015 Champion of Children efforts. Job well done. Our speakers today are champions of a healthy community and a healthy dialogue. Please join me in welcoming Dawn Tyler Lee, Senior Vice President for Community Impact at the United Way of Central Ohio, Mo Wright, President and CEO of Rama Consulting Group, Jason Reese, Director of Research at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at OSU, James L. Moore III, EHE Distinguished Professor of Urban Education in the College of Education and Human Ecology, OSU, and Renee Olate, Assistant Professor in the College of Social Work at OSU. Let's provide a warm welcome for all of our speakers. Great. So next, Don Tyler Lee will provide a short overview of the Champion of Children's Report. Then Mo Wright will lead the panel in conversation. Don, the podium is yours. We've gotten used to the idea that certain groups of people will fail disproportionately, will drop out of school, will end up unemployed, will end up behind bars, and whenever we have an issue like that, that we get accustomed to, then there is no sense of urgency. This is one of the reasons why I think it's almost a problem to call it a crisis. If it were a crisis, we'd respond with urgency. Until we realize our whole society is imperiled when we allow a segment of our population to be endangered in these ways, we won't marshal the resources needed to change it. Author, scholar, and national expert on boys of color, Dr. Pedro Nogueira. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is the third year we have produced the report each year focusing on a topic that is critical to the educational success of our children. Today's release of our 2015 report is an important part of a series of efforts Champion of Children is leading to raise awareness and mobilize our community around issues facing boys of color. Frankly, recognizing that conversations about race and achievement can be uncomfortable we struggled a bit internally about whether or not boys of color was a theme that would resonate with and be supported by our community. We had no idea how it would be received, but looking at the data, we knew it was the right thing to do. In the words of John Kennedy, if not us, who? If not now, when? We knew it was our responsibility to bring awareness to the needs and challenges of boys of color in our community and it has been inspiring and energizing to see the support for this work, much of which has come from those of you in this room. And two bold community leaders get a lot of the credit who said we must provide a forum for meaningful conversation around this important topic. 
Linda Cass, who unfortunately could not be with us today, a United Way board member and the founder of Champion of Children, and also my boss, mentor, and friend, Janet Jackson, president and CEO of United Way of Central Ohio. Thank you for your courageous leadership. And of course, this topic could not be more timely. Many of us have experienced a range of emotions from anger to fear to frustration surrounding violent incidents involving boys and men of color that sadly seem more commonplace than unusual. But as with any issue that is thrust upon the public consciousness with such force, there is often a lot of heat but not enough light. The Champion of Children report and today's discussion are designed to provide more light. Our goal is to present the facts about the many challenges that face our boys of color and to offer perspectives that frame and encourage discussion about how we can all come together to improve the lives of our boys because after all, they belong to all of us. And make no mistake, the opportunities to succeed we do or do not provide our boys of color has a direct bearing on our success as a community. Let me state it even more plainly. We cannot consider Central Ohio a thriving community if we recognize those among us who face the greatest discrimination, have the steepest road to climb, and we choose to sit idly by and do nothing. To paraphrase Dr. Nagara, this is not a black or Latino male problem. This is an American problem. It belongs to all of us. And when you understand the depth of this problem, the impact can be numbing. Dr. Nagara also says, African American and Latino males are overrepresented in every area we associate with failure and underrepresented in every area we associate with success. Let me say that again. African American and Latino males are overrepresented in every area we associate with failure and underrepresented in every area we associate with success. This is an unacceptable legacy that we must all work to dismantle and replace with hope and opportunity. One of the first steps in that process is clearly understanding the nature of the challenges that face our boys of color. Challenges like implicit bias, in which we subconsciously categorize boys as less capable and more dangerous or uncontrollable because of their skin color. As our report points out, the effects of this bias begin early in the lives of our children. For example, 48% of all preschool children who are suspended more than once are black. Preschool. And research indicates that expectations of delinquent behavior are self-fulfilling. So is there any surprise that black youth are incarcerated at six times the rate of white youth and Latino and Hispanic youth are incarcerated at twice the rate of white youth? Of course, there are many other factors that our boys face, including poverty, lack of parental involvement, and unsafe neighborhoods. But even after you control for all of those factors, racial bias emerges as a huge obstacle. We have created a preschool to prison pipeline, and we must end it. And the best way to do that is to create a sense of urgency and act. That is the fundamental purpose of the Champion of Children report and the panel discussion that will soon commence. Raise awareness of the issue, share the research, and mobilize the community. I urge you to carefully read the executive summary, which is at your places, and the full report, which is in the lobby. It may also be downloaded from our United Way of Central Ohio website. The report tells the story of the terrible odds that our boys of color face but it also tells of local efforts to provide opportunities that give them a better chance of success. As I stated previously, we must challenge implicit bias as individuals and within our institutions. We must repair the pipeline to educational success. 
We must ensure healthy neighborhoods and support healthy, strong, and resilient families. We must invest in evidence-based mentoring programs and coaching to support our young people. For if we don't expose them to the possibilities, how will they know what's possible? Boys of color have underachieved in part because society has had such low expectations of them. Therefore, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we must embrace a new narrative of resilience and high expectations for our black and Latino boys. It is long past time to break the cycle and help our boys of color achieve their potential and strengthen our community. Our successes are small but encouraging, and I challenge all of us to tackle this American problem by understanding it and getting engaged with a true sense of urgency. As I turn the conversation over to United Way and CMC board member Mo Wright, let me uh, make a brief announcement. At your places, there's a postcard, a save the date postcard, and it is for our statewide education summit that will be held October 23rd and 24th. Please do mark your calendars and plan to participate so that we can uh, continue this conversation. And finally, let me close with this thought from Frederick Douglass, who said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And as the old saying goes, where there is a will, there is a way. With a vibrant community like ours, I know it is our collective will to build strong children. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and uh, thank you to uh, my colleagues both at United Way and the Columbus Metropolitan Club for elevating this conversation. Uh, let's jump in. Uh, a few points from the report that you might find interesting. Uh, black students are expelled three times as often as white students. Four-year high school graduation rates in the state of Ohio for whites is 87.3%. For non-whites, it's 67.2%. For black males, 54%. Children who lived in poverty for at least four years scored six to nine points lower on standardized IQ tests and verbal tests compared with other students. And in 2013, the Juvenile Detention Center uh, reported that black youth were 75.7% of the total uh, contact with the Juvenile Detention Center compared with 23% of whites. My uh, question to uh, this panel, and I'll start with uh, Jason here, is simple, but I imagine the answer is not. Why is that the case with our boys? So if we look at the foundation of what is needed for success for kids, which we've spent a lot of time the last two years working on with Champion of Children's, strong, stable neighborhoods, uh, freedom from trauma, freedom from stress, freedom from poverty, a supportive, stable family. What we see for boys of color in particular, um, that they're the most, uh, disadvantaged and dangerously situated in terms of all these risk factors. In addition to that, what we've learned through the cognitive sciences through implicit bias is that for too many boys of color, they are not afforded the luxury of being boys or children. They're viewed by our society as older. They're viewed as more threatening. And these stereotypical views, which are so prevalent in law enforcement, uh, within our school systems, within many of our agencies even, and within our broader dialogue within this community is extremely damaging. And so while we need solutions that support these young men, we also need to look at ourselves as a community and question our own institutions, challenge ourselves to say, are these biases impacting our decisions, impacting the way we treat certain folks within our community? Um, and it's these two confounding factors of bias and structural challenges which can be so perilous for these young men. Dr. Moore, what else is going on? We talked about bias. What else is, is, is happening here? Well, certainly when you have bias, you're not afforded the opportunity to develop the appropriate skills so you can be successful. 
uh, African American males and Latino males are often seen as a part of a group rather than an individual. A stigma and inferiority follows them everywhere they go. Uh, one thing about the report is that, you know, um, oftentimes what is missing is, it is we look at the ones who tend to come from low income, but when the world see a child, they see blackness and maleness. They don't see income. In fact, when you look at some of the NAEP data, the achievement gap is greater for the $100,000 a year black family and the $100,000 white family. So these challenges are sort of like uh, historical and we haven't been able to break away from them. But the paradox is something similar to what Jason just said. Um, there are a lot of labels attached to black males and they're not always positive. You can read all the popular literature and you see a doom and gloom. But unfortunately, when you think about it, uh, and from a mental health, being a counselor by training, you can't give people treatment without a label. You can't give them an IEP, an individual educational plan, without being diagnosed as needing special education. You can't give them a 504. But it, most of us, we remember classical sociological literature, labeling theory. The only way a label comes off a group is the group take the label off the person. Uh, your kid can be a gifted and talented student. Unfortunately, they can chronically underachieve for the rest of their lives, but they're forever gifted and talented. But unfortunately, many of our young boys, when you look at many of the urban school systems across the nation, they're grossly underrepresented even when they're in school settings where their African American Latino is um, more represented than other racial groups. So it suggests that it is, this is a problem so systemic, so pervasive, uh, and the factors, as Jason said, uh, it's not just one factor, and it's not just poverty. Poverty heightens these factors even worse, primarily because poverty kind of summons us to certain geographical spaces. We have kids in Columbus who never left the South Side, and they think about Ohio State all the time. And uh, it's just a figment of their imagination. My son in D.C. Got, in Virginia got a better chance to come on the campus than some of the kids who live really local. Uh, that's a tragedy. And that's a, it's a, not a Shakespearean tragedy. It's a tragedy that we all can change overnight. Uh, it's not just uh, a mentor. And it's not just um, taking the kid out of the hood and giving them exposure. It, requires a lot of coaching and skill development because that's how you increase efficacy for children is by having achievement. Um, Let me get uh, Dr. Olate in here because I think uh, one of the points that just got raised was about cultural norms, what's happening in our communities and our neighborhoods. As you think about for uh, uh, Latino uh, boys of color, for African American boys of color, what is happening in our neighborhoods culturally that's either uh, perpetuating some of these issues or, or perhaps helping in some cases? I would like to start with more bad news first, if you allow me. <laughs> As if we didn't have enough of that, go ahead. I would like to broaden the scope of the conversation too. I think it's important to talk about boys of colors, Latinos and African Americans, but we will be in a very good place if we say this is just a problem of this race of specific ethnicities. Uh, we have a big problem about inequality in this society, and not just in this society, but in the entire world. Um, so it's not just about talking about minority, it's about talking about the growing inequality gap in this country that is not affecting just uh, children of colors. It's affecting white kids, and we have always the example about Ohio, the Appalachian uh, is the gap is growing in the entire society, not just within minority communities. And bad news in the sense of it's a, it's a bigger problem, but when we talk about like these three basic elements about differences, so difference in a strong family structure, it's clear about the difference between African-American, Latino communities, and white communities, the difference of quality schools and teachers is completely different, the scope of that. But what is 
common and is more important is what we are going to do about social interactions. And that, to me, is one of the big challenges. And one of the things that we can do easily than to try to affect the other big element of the structure. When I'm referring to social interaction, I'm referring about communities. And now I'm coming back to your question and about maybe good news. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about data, we are going to see all the graphs more or less in this way. Down all the trends, we have multiple sources of data that are showing like big, big problems about the future, especially when you talk about what is going to happen in 5, 10, 15, or 20 years with our communities. Um, I think in terms of like social interaction. Uh, one of the big challenges to me about my experience with communities is basically about what are the interaction between African-American kids and Latino kids in our communities. I think this is one of the big challenges that I see in communities. Uh, the basic interaction, and please excuse me, some of the statement here um, are going to say, African-American are lazy, Latinos are working hard. If we consistently reproduce this statement that are in the Latino community, we are not going just to uh, address important issues in the minority communities, but we are going to exacerbate the problem that we have in our communities. Mm. So to me, the problem is not just about one and the other, it's how we are going to embrace culturally, social norms in communities about how we are going to deal with that issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are competing about who is bad in some communities, if the Latino gang or is the African-American gang. Mm -hmm. And I think this is pervasive in terms of communities. So let, let's turn that on its head. Um, there are certainly success stories from uh, communities of color. Uh, and so talk about, as you look at the research, um, Dr. Moore, and what do those defining factors look like? I mean, what are those uh, attributes or what is happening in those uh, situations where there are success stories? Is it parental? Is it environmental? Is it society? What are those things that are really shaping success and how do we replicate that in our community? I would say parents matter. Um, but quite frankly, we have parents who have households with two parents in a household and they can't get the boy to do anything either. And, and they have plenty of money. And, uh, but what is quite significant is not just parents is having, he talks about social interactions, it's about significant relationships and how meaningful those significant relationships are. We know historically that's over 60 years, we just did a Brown versus Board of Education uh, special issue and look at 60 years is that we've really basically been saying the same things. But, but what's so fundamental, and what I found, what the work that we do at the center, first of all, we got to help change young men the way they think about themselves. And in turn, we need to help those who interact with them change the way they think about them. It's a, that social interaction is quite critical because I have some young men who came from some of the most vulnerable spaces in Ohio. I'm talking about where work has virtually disappeared. And they come to Ohio State and they're kicking butt. They're doing better than kids who come from some of our most affluent suburbs. Why? Some kids achieve in spite of. And usually in reports, we typically, and thank you you didn't do that, mm -hmm. is that we always talk about why they don't make it. But what about the kids who come from the same conditions? It's something that is fundamentally, that is profound about these students that we really need to study more of that rather than developing interventions based on deficits rather than strengths. And that's most important. Very good. Very good. Jason, I want to uh, get you in here. I know you were certainly one of the chief authors of the report. I had the pleasure of facilitating the group early on, and, and one of the, the challenges we had was grappling with how much data is out there and how to tell this story. Did anything about the, in the report strike you? Um, were you surprised by any of the data you saw, or what, what stands out to you about what you uncovered here with this report? Well, you know, I've been doing this work for some time and, and buried in this data often. Um, but, you know, I guess something that that Don referenced earlier that still just uh, is so 
striking to me is that even for preschool kids, we still see kids who are uh, dispropor disproportionately disciplined. And you know, historically, we've thought this was something that just emerges as kids get older uh, in the K-12 environment. Uh, but now we have folks talking about, you know, maybe it's a preschool to prison pipeline. And that's just traumatic. As, as the father of a preschooler, um, it's horrifying. The, the other thing that I really want to note to build off of James's comment is, in some ways, the solutions to some of these challenges are not rocket science. We had the pleasure of having Jeff Canada here two years ago from Champion of Children's. And Jeff Canada's done a phenomenal job of closing achievement gaps in his Harlem Children's Zone. We have programs like Brotherhood Sister Soul in West Harlem, where through this constant coaching over the course of 10, 15 years, they have 95% of their young men in college or working at sustainable wages at the age of 21. And that's amazing. So really what it takes is political will. And it also requires thinking about, and to come back to this notion of our institutions. When we talk about bias in our systems, the solution is not necessarily within focusing on those folks who bear the burden of that bias. It's in challenging our systems. And we need more supportive work in our systems. And I'll point to the great work of the Bell Center um, in creating a conducive environment where these young men can thrive. Um, and the need to really study and, and understand why do we see this hyper-resiliency. Because there's a great article put out by the Journal of uh, the American Medical Association noted last year. We still don't want to forget that while disproportionately represented, the majority of African American men do finish school. They do work. They take care of their families. They avoid the incarceration system. And we don't spend enough time understanding the assets of those young men and how they have developed this hyper-resiliency despite the challenging environment. Mm. Uh, as you know, it is our, our tradition here at CMC to have audience questions. So for those of you who might want to ask a question, you can start making your way to the microphones. I'm going to pose one additional question to the panelists, and I'll start with Dr. Olate. Um, we've talked a lot about in the report about the educational gap um, and what is happening with uh, disproportionate uh, levels between African-American, Latino boys and other communities. But we've thrown a lot of money at it. we put quite a few resources that have been task force and reports for a number of years. What are we missing? I mean, what is not happening with just this, the not simple but certainly important goal of closing the achievement gap educationally for our boys? What's happening? What's not happening? I feel like in one of the main discussion when we talk about public education in general, not just in the US, but in any country in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, uh, is what is education for a society? And for some people, education is a commodity, it's a product in the market, and for other people, education is a right. And we still are debating about that in this society if education is a right that should be equally distributed in society or should be a product in the market. And I don't think that we're going to resolve this tension today or <laughs> in the following years, but uh, wh what we see in this tension, for example, is the, um, the cheating scandal in Atlanta public schools. So in order to improve numbers, we are going to do everything and then we have a disaster about public school that is not just about number. More important than that, it's not just about money. Uh, there are consistent research showing that if you increase the budget in education, you are not going to have the same level of result or impact. So the problem is not about just money, to put more money. Going again about the, the gap, the inequality gap between educated family and not educated families. This is not just about the school, it's about families. So an average, an educated family, educated parents are investing 45 minutes with kids before going to sleep, 45 minutes. How we are going to close this gap? 
these 45 minutes that we are, I said, I invested this time with my kid. I'm investing with this kid, your kid. How we are going to close these gaps in the future? You can say it's technology. Yes, we have access to technology, but we have research that is not just about technology, it's about quality of technology. So most poor kids are investing time in internet, in entertainment. Educated, social class kids are using internet for other purposes, not just to internet. So challenges are there, how we're going to close the gap. Again, to me, it's about social interactions. It's about how we are moving that. My, of course, we can do anything about public education, but it seems that it's very challenging in this area and probably it's not my expertise. Dr. Moore, jump in there. Well, let me just say that there are a whole number of factors College Board has produced and it's, it's very aligned to, with the work that Jason did. But some argue, some social scientists argue that the achievement gap begins in the mother's womb with health care, is housing. If you think about, I'm just gonna make a big leap, many in here I'm assuming is middle class. We don't choose houses because we like the house. We choose houses because the schools are nice and they're well. They, and even if you don't have kids, you choose those schools because there's a correlation with your house and I mean uh, the schools and, and the value of your home. And so, but, but working poor, working class families choose homes for trying to find a space to live. Now, for example, when we think about what can schools do? Well, first of all, mobility rates are high in urban systems. Why, and I use a high school, why do we have one school on a four by four, one on a traditional, and you know that these kids, if they transfer to another school, they're gonna have gaps in the system. The system didn't adapt to the kids. We want kids to adapt to the system. So we need the system to adapt to the kids. I mean. I could go back when, this, when they integrate public schools in Columbus. And I'll use Columbus because I know a lot about Columbus, but I've been in Cleveland. I've been in all the major urban areas because I did the governor's contract. I had the achievement gap contract to go in those spaces. Is that we've been saying the same thing. We've been saying health care is the issue. We've been saying housing is the issue. We've been saying teaching is the issue. We, there's nothing I really can tell this group today that you haven't heard, but what I will say that is what, what's good about this place, what keeps me in Columbus, it is one of the most philanthropic, caring, and it's not a lack of interest, mm -hmm. but it's not, po it's not coordinated really well. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of silos. We hadn't decided what we want to focus on. Yeah. And, and so I think we got to do that. We need to say, this is what we're going to focus on. And if we say just attendance, some would say, why are we focused on attendance? Look at the attendance rate. You don't have a chance if you don't come to school. At least we gotta get you there. Then we can focus on quality once we d d get you in school. And those are some quick, simple, but the factors are not just one thing. It's a multitude of different factors. Well, you know, the, the great thing about being here at, at the Metropolitan Club is we have in the room policymakers, we have city council, I've seen school board members here today. Jason, what, I mean, from a policy perspective, what do we need to be thinking about as a community? I mean, what are those, it may not be low-hanging fruit, but certainly those, um, those pressure points, touch points, we can really start to work on as a community to move this issue and, and see some better results. So the first thing is to better, just as Dr. Moore noted, to better align the different interventions that we're working on. Um, last year we were here having this conversation about infant mortality. I can tell you that many of the neighborhoods that are being focused on with Celebrate One are the same neighborhoods that have some of the most disadvantaged young African-American men uh, in them today. How are we coordinating some of those efforts? Also, we have to think about our budgets in particular. Where's spending going? Where's our public dialogue around education? If all the references to the achievement gap are really emphasizing testing and not emphasizing all the many things that, as Dr. Moore stated, we've been saying repeatedly are so critical you're not going to improve the achievement gap if you have 40, 50 percent of the kids moving from school to school every year. It's too much instability. And so we really need to put our money where the research is and where intellectually we know the pressure points are. We need solid neighborhoods. We need more supportive programs for these young men. So when the family 
cannot provide an environment of stability, there's other supports there to help them out. And again, make that commitment real with the investments and the dollars that we have in our very wealthy community, because we are a rich community and a community that does care. I'll uh, uh, let any of you jump in on this. And again, if you are interested in asking a question, you can make your way toward uh, the microphones here in the center of the room. Uh, as we think about um, the report talked about underrepresentation um, of boys of color, uh, kids of color, uh, in either underemployed or um, un unemployed. What's behind that? And how do we start to think about uh, doing better by way of getting meaningful job creation among these communities so that folks can see a way out of some of the situation they're a part of? What do we have to do early in that workforce development pipeline? And what should we be doing for those who are already uh, of age, but certainly still are underemployed? So I'll say, uh, I'll jump out with the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about yet, which is our incarceration policies. If we continue to have a system that's hyper punitive for folks who have any kind of infraction, even as a youth, um, and makes them completely uncompetitive when it comes to the job market, we're gonna continue to see these employment problems. Uh, reforming a lot of our criminal justice system is economic reform. It enables people to basically be economically empowered. Um, I think that has to be part of it, as well as education. Anybody else? I, I would say that uh, what is a void in the schools, and it's a, we made a big shift. Our schools in the early 1800s, it was a big career vocational piece. And now we went to the extreme end that is all about academic and honors. And I'm not, I'm saying this, and I'm saying this for my kid too, because some people say what's good for other kids, but I'm saying this for my kids too. But I'm saying, but we had a doc student at Ohio State who is in career and technical education, and he studied students who had just a career technical education, those who had just a college preparatory education, and he used national data, so it was representative of the population, and those who had career slash academic honors. The kids who had career slash academic honors had made more money over a lifetime than those who just had the opposite. That's why we have students who matriculate at Ohio State. They say they're gonna be a doctor. I bet I have some in this room who came to their higher education institution, said they're gonna be a doctor, and they changed their mind after they had organic chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> be, be, because, and, because it's a high level of uh, lack of career maturity, and I just had a course with one of our programs with inner city kids all across the state, Many of them think they are, they're interested in one thing, but there's a disconnect between their interest and actual real-time experiences. So pre-college programs matter. We need to invest more in them. IB programs matter. Parents matter. In the state of Ohio, we survey all 12th graders all across the state, even when we control for income, for geographical location, urbanicity, parents always matter. So that suggests that we need to do more education for parents. And I'm not saying educate them, teach them how to raise their kids, because we got two parent households who make a lot of money. I wouldn't want to learn nothing from them, because I've been in their households. But I'm just saying the fact of the matter is, is how to navigate, engage. A family that eats with their family four times a year, uh, I mean four times a week, those kids do better in school. I ain't talk about reading or any of those things. These are some strategic things, but most of us I'm looking at, they're either a little bit older or around my age. There were only like three channels that we could watch, CBS, NBC, and we all watched Walter Cronkite, and we all talked about current events. Now we got two parent households that they don't spend any time because everybody is chasing the dollar or chasing their jobs to move up and up. A lot to think about. We're going to come to audience questions. Uh, as you step to the podium, we'll ask that you uh, uh, tell us your name and, and uh, what you're representing. And we uh, thank you in advance for avoiding long editorial comments. Thank you. I'm Jane Scott with Metropolitan Club, and thank you all for being here. I was in Chicago last weekend with my husband, and we were on the L, uh, clearly going through an area uh, from the west, or the, yeah, the west side into downtown that was a less lower income area. There was a little black boy that got on the train. And uh, he was trying to interact with some older black fellas. And um, 
he stomped away and said, and I'm quoting, I hate being black. They treat me worse than the white people do. And, you know, I wanted to reach out and give that little boy a hug. I'm a middle-aged, I'm a 60-something white woman, totally not acceptable. Talk a little bit more about the children-to-children -children relationships and what's happening there to help children build their self-confidence and, and to be better allies for each other. Let me just say, don't dismiss your power to influence. Uh, it was a little white elderly woman who got me here to this point. Teachers are 84% white women. So white women play a critical role in the process and I don't want to dismiss that because if you look at historically in the urban centers, there really were only like three predominantly black uh, teacher force school districts in America. Detroit, Washington DC, and New Orleans. And they all have something in common. Everybody took them over. So what I found when I took a leave of absence in the DC public schools and worked, that I found that people who looked just like these kids were sometimes worse than the people who didn't look like them. And so what I'm saying to you, people tell me all the time that they're from the hood, but they ain't been in the hood in a long time. And so I'm saying it's about relationships and being people who have been marginalized, this is a counseling we train, we can train, I can train people how to do this, how to be empathetic, how to be caring. Because when you've been marginalized, you look at people to see really whether or not they have high expectations in you. And it just doesn't start when you're in kid. I'm an adult. I can tell when colleagues don't think I could do something or not. I mean, it, it's, it's systemic. But what I say, when you ask your question about the kids, there's a book called The Pack. And what we try to do at Ohio State with our young men, we try to put people with pack. What has happened all across America when they matriculated at Ohio State, some of my young men, this is the first time in their entire life they've ever been in a room with 60 to 100 black males who are equally as bright as they are. That's educational malpractice. And they wait until we get to college to have these kind of experiences. So you have to put people, my daddy, he was a Bonanza fan, so I grew up in the country, so you appreciate this. <laughs> And so we had a horse like Ben Cartwright, Little Joe, and Adam Cartwright. The day I was born, he brought those horses. <laughs> and one of the things he said, he said, Sonny, even if you ain't a stallion, but if you run with stallions, you'll start believing that you're a stallion. And you can break the spirit of a stallion, even though you've been told that you were not a stallion. I have young people on my campus, they've been told that they're not stallions, and they're breaking the spirit of kids who said they were stallions. So I'm saying part of it is in your mind, and we have to work on people's mind to say they, they can and they will. Just like Gabby Douglas, you ask people about her, Gabby Douglas is the beloved darling of the Olympics, but nobody cared until she got to that point in her life. And that's what I tell my young men, nobody cares if you're poor and broke until you make it. Next question. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Alicia Gillison. I'm the Chief Academic Officer in Columbus City Schools. Mo, you asked a question, and it was about the achievement gap. And we talked about how we pour money in and how we're trying to close or eliminate that achievement gap. What I didn't hear us talk about, which is a great contributor to the achievement gap, James Moore hit on it. It is belief. It is what we have to do is we have to eliminate the belief gap because it is when parents don't believe that their children can succeed, when teachers don't believe and lower their expectations in the classroom, when we start enabling children as opposed to empowering children, these same children grow up to be adults that are enabled waiting on the system. It's social perceptions. Last week I had the opportunity of listening to Dr. Frank Barnes, and it, the information he shared wasn't new information, but it was brought to me in a different way. And he says, with African American males, African American males are three times more responsive to what they think you think about them. Not actually what you think about them, but what they think you think about them. So it's about taking off the labels. It's about 
busting that belief gap because you talked about those students because we do have African-American students and Latino students who are being very successful. What's different? What's different is someone told them that they could. Someone told them that they believed in them. They may come from a single parent house home. They may be living with grandparents, aunts, or uncles. But somewhere, someone has poured into them that they can do it and that they do believe. So I wanted to share that piece when you talked about the achievement gap, because equally important is the belief gap. Thank you. Jason? I want to thank you for saying that, and I completely agree with you. I do want to pull a word of caution from Pedro Negrera when he was here this spring. And I think a really powerful point that he made. And whether we're talking about belief of optimism or other personal attributes or the work around grit that uh, we featured last year in regards to how children succeed, uh, a theme of last year's Champion of Children, grit without opportunity is not very effective. Right? So while these are important issues, we also want to make sure that those real opportunity structures are there for our boys. Because if they're not, we'll be raising expectations and then making their pathway forward even more challenging. Good. Next question. Thank you. I'm Michelle Moskowitz-Brown, Executive Director at Local Matters. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm speaking as a parent of a Columbus City School student. So I guess my question is, from a practical point of view and sort of an identification point of, of view, what would you recommend in terms of policies? Um, there's a new gifted and talented school that's opening in the fall here, and the representation there will be 60% Caucasian, 40% children of color. So we know that's not representative of our Columbus City School system. And a lot of parents don't realize that that's a problem. Um, we have a really practical opportunity here to close the identification gap on gifted and talented services, and I'd love your thoughts on how we can do that. Any thoughts? Well, I love Columbus City School, let me say that. Um, <clears throat> I sit on the national board for gifted children, and if Donna Ford was here, a former faculty member and colleague, she said we're still trying to desegregate gifted and talented programs. And the number one way to get in gifted and talented programs is recommendation of the teachers. And so it goes back to that implicit right. bias. Yeah. Uh, even when kids, uh, you know, even my own kid, I, my wife is a pistol now. I wouldn't even want to deal with my wife if I was. <laughs> <laughs> you realize it's on TV, right? Yeah, I know, but I, she knows that. I've known her since I was 12, but I can say that. But uh, nevertheless, even her, she didn't recognize what I did she didn't start reading my work until she had the experience through her, my own children. When you said a um, exceptional cognitive ability, see, I know the data because I done looked at it. You're going to have very few students already going to be eligible for those uh, opportunities. But Joe Runzellini in Connecticut, who's kind of the premier person, he would say we need to embrace a talent development model. And how do we? ensure that every child gets optimal opportunities to grow. I know when we talk about achievement gaps, uh, it's important to talk about that. But at the end of the day, what happens in school districts, I understand why Columbus did it, because let's face it, this is what they did in Connecticut. This is what they do because they don't want white flight. Mm -hmm. They have to have these kind of programs because that's what keep middle class and uh, affluent whites and blacks in the neighborhoods. But what I would think we need to do is continue to maintain our school level programs because primarily what will happen, families, even when their mothers and fathers want them to be there, we are finding increasingly African-American families are opting out of those programs because their kids are the only ones in those programs. And in turn, if anybody ever been in a space, when people naturally, interact and engage each other based on their comfort level. Many of our young people live, just like the report, in dense areas that is predominantly black and predominantly poor. Then you're going to put them in the environment where none of this, no training. And another thing in Columbus City Schools, it's not unique to Columbus City Schools, it's a lack of diversity mm -hmm. of those who teach gifted and talented programs. In fact, very few people think it because many families, people of families of color, or teachers, 
of color as well think that those are not the opportunities that they need to pursue. So in some regard, the gifted and talented students of color are neglected more than anybody else mm -hmm. because it's not a federal mandate like special education. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've got one more question, maybe? You talked about the social component. And uh, Columbus is a very welcoming city, so much so that we have immigrants and refugees, you know, who come. Uh, we have the largest population in the whole state. Um, we have undocumented youth. And that's, uh, that's a conversation that I, I believe I'd like to add to this. Um, but also, could you share with us on your experience and your expertise, um, how do we do that as a society? Because it's very important to note these are students that are straight A students, many of them. And not only that, um, they're going to be part of our workforce. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, my students always ask me about the question about immigration, and they tend to see reality in like very, this is that here, and this is that here, black or white. And the topic of immigration, most people tend to see it in this way. And we see families in Columbus or in many other states of this country in which we have families, we have citizens, we have green card holders, and we have undocumented people. So it's not just the pro it's not a simple issue to talk about the immigration problem as you very well said. We have important challenges here in terms of like how we see problems, how we see the issues. And I'm, I'm going to tie with the, with the second uh, elephant in the room that we haven't talked, uh, drugs. Um, if we check the problem of the African-American men in prison, the problem in about the two generation is huge. If we see the problem of Latinos in prison and we put a slash drugs, the problem is huge. What is the role that drug is playing in society? I'm going to connect to immigration immediately. Um, we have a huge problem of people moving drugs from Mexico, Central America, South America to the US, right? They're bringing drugs here. This is an economic problem. It's an incentive problem. To move drugs from Colombia to the border is a six billion industry, United Nations data. Once it's in the US, it's a 29 billion industry. The incentive is here. How we are going to stop or how we are going to relate with these expensive drugs that are not consumed in general by poor African-American kids or poor Latino kids are consumed by white people in this society. And we have data about that, formal data, who are consuming drugs. It's mostly white people in comparison when we put the percentage of the entire population. So what is the role of drugs in poor communities? Uh, what is the role of Latino dealing with drugs. I, I study youth gangs in Central America, and I said that it's impossible to understand the problem of youth gangs if we don't understand the problem of youth gangs in this country, because it's a complete product that was moved from here to there. Again, I was invited to um, a community intervention in Wayland Park for a very well-intentioned person who wanted to fund that, and he said, Yes, I want to create a community problem, but what you are telling me, I said, is about working one-on-one -on -one with the kids and maybe with the family. So I don't see community intervention. I teach the class uh, community development at the College of Social Work. And I said, but you, you are suggesting a one-on-one -on -one therapy tradition here. I don't see any component of community development in your intervention that you are suggesting. And they said, well, what happened is what we need basically is to move the drugs from Wayland Park. And if we are moving the drug from Wayland Park to here to two blocks, I'm satisfied with that. This is not a community intervention. 
And worse than that, I said, you know what is the problem here is who are consuming drugs or who are selling drugs these kids, these African-American kids or the Latino kids there are white students or white professors at OSU, mostly. So I think that we need to have a serious conversation about gangs and about youth and about drugs in communities, in African-American communities and in Latino communities. They are soldiers of a good business. Please don't confuse drugs with youth gangs or youth gangs with cartels or youth gang with drug trafficking organization. It's not the same. And especially in African-American community or in Latino communities, in poor marginalized communities. Coming back to the question about immigration again. One of the main problems that we are seeing with these new immigrants, and I'm part of them, uh, one of these new immigrants, I've been in this country for 15 years, I'm a citizen of this country, and, and, and I have a bilingual household, which is fantastic to me. One of the main problems that we can put across, Latinos and African American, is the concept, and I say social connection here, is the concept of masculinities. In Latino culture, is the concept of macho. How the African-American community are going to raise kids in which they don't have 50% of the parents. They don't have, period. What is a second generation approach when we see that the significant percentage of African-American male or the likelihood, the likelihood to be in prison is average in this country 30%, but we have communities in which is 70%, 70% of African American youth. You got 30 seconds. Uh, I feel like this is a serious issue. The last thing, uh, my two best students in community development couldn't find a job in community interventions, so they are doing therapy. Uh, this is a challenge for people who are creating or developing funding. So there are no jobs about community intervention, and this is what we need the most because it's more efficient and it's cheaper. Kermit? Wow, what a great and wide-ranging discussion on this important topic. Really highlights the point. <laughs> really highlights the points made in the Champion of Children report that success of our boys of color is critical to the success of our entire community. I hope you enjoyed today's forum. We encourage you to continue the conversation in the lobby with coffee and cookies. Remember that you can view and share all of our forums on CTV, Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Before we conclude, please help me thank our sponsors, Fifth Third Bank, The Ohio State University, and our speakers, Dawn Tyler Lee, Mo Wright, Jason Reese, James Moore, and Renee Olatte. And thank you for being here today. We hope to see you again soon.